What is the depth of Holy Eucharist or Holy Communion? What exactly is the sacrament of Holy Eucharist? Is it simply a ceremony where we get together in church, we sing some hymns, we participate in something, and that's all? This is a very serious question, very interesting indeed, and for this reason I would like to elaborate a little extensively on this subject. The sacrament of Holy Eucharist, or Holy Communion, or as it's commonly called, represents the heart of all the sacraments, and of course the liturgy in which it takes place. It is also the heart of the heart, not only of our worship, but also of our faith. It is there that the body and blood of Christ is celebrated. We have him, the Christ, the true Christ, with his true bodily nature being present. We have his human nature present. This is most thrilling. And this is the focal point of this entire subject. Christ said, take, eat, this is my body, he told his disciples. Drink from this, all of you. Drink from this cup. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. This do out of remembrance for me. Father adds Luke the Evangelist and St. Paul continues in his first letter to the Corinthians. No one else, of course, has understood the sacrament of Holy Communion as well as the disciples. Therefore, they who were present and completely understood the sacrament of Holy Eucharist recorded it exactly as they truly saw it and exactly how the Lord said it. This is why St. Paul will later on write in his first epistle to the Corinthians, and I quote, Because I received from the Lord, because the Lord was appearing to Paul face to face, and he was not getting this theological knowledge from someone else or a middle person or a disciple, but directly this which I have passed down to you, that the Lord Jesus, at the night of his surrender, he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke the bread. After he prayed to the Father, he broke the bread with his hands, did not use a knife or anything to cut it. He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body and so on. So we can see at this point that the Lord is being very clear, and if you wish to consider the other view, the negative one, is it possible that his words were misunderstood? Well, obviously not because of a specific incident. When Christ was speaking with some of the representatives of Capernaum after the miraculous feeding of the 5,000, and they were seeking him, he said, You are seeking me because you ate bread and you are satisfied. Do not seek the bread that perishes, but the bread that endures forever. The bread that endures, which gives the true life. What is this bread? they asked. I am the bread from heaven, the true manna. And here he used some serious and shocking words. Whoever does not eat my flesh and drink my blood does not have eternal life or remission of sins. Because they understood this perfectly, they were surprised. Eat his flesh and drink his blood? They said his words were hard and they deserted him. At this point, when the Lord saw them leaving, he turns to the twelve disciples and he tells them, Do you want to leave too? because I mean exactly what I said, which meant that this bread and wine would be his body and blood, really and truly, because if we assume that there was a misunderstanding, he could easily say to the representatives which came from Capernaum, 
Hey, hold on. Don't go. That's not what I meant, that you would tear me to pieces and eat my flesh. But I meant, I meant it symbolically or metaphorically. In other words, I was using a figure of speech. Not only he did none of this, but he turns to the disciples and says, If you think any differently or believe any differently than what I just said, you can get up and leave also. Do you want to leave? Go. Obviously, here the Lord meant exactly what the disciples understood. It is truly his body and blood. To further see this, let's listen to a great confession made by the Sithios of Jerusalem. It's the 17th condition of his confession which explains this beautifully. It's the 17th condition of his confession caused by the appearance of the Protestants in our history. He says, Of the sacrament of Holy Eucharist, we believe that Jesus Christ is present, but in what way? Because even now Christ is here, Christ is everywhere, at the mountain, everywhere we go. In what way is he present? And he says here, he is present in the bread and wine, not symbolically. They are not a symbol of his body and blood, no, nor is he represented by these that they present an image of his body and blood, nor do we simply have an exceeding amount of grace like the other sacraments, nor is it simply a presence due to the bread and wine like some of the fathers explain about holy baptism, nor do we have a coexistence of the Lord in the bread and the wine, like the Lutherans and some of the Protestants so erroneously believe. None of this, absolutely none of this, says the Sithios of Jerusalem. But, but really and truly is the Christ. So then, after the sanctification of the bread and the wine, they transform, transubstantiate, reform, and the bread changes into the very body of the Lord. Which body? Here this may come a shock to many. The very body that the Word received from the ever-Virgin Mary in Bethlehem, the Theotokos. The very body which was baptized in the Jordan River, suffered on the cross, was buried, resurrected. The same body that the disciples touched the same body, the one that ascended to heaven, which sits at the right hand of the Father, which will come through the clouds of the heaven. The wine is transformed and changed in the very blood of the Lord, which was pouring out of his body when hanging on the cross, so the world would have life. This is most thrilling, and this is the central meaning of our whole faith that we partake of the body and blood of Christ. This is why we should not take communion when we are not prepared. This is why we are very careful how we approach to avoid any type of small accident at this very crucial moment. Translators note, it has been the practice of our church that if at this crucial moment, and in case of an accident, where an amount of Holy Communion would fall on the floor, the priest, with much fear and trembling, would try to literally lick it off the floor, and in the case of carpeting or floor covering, that spot would be removed, cut out, and burned. Once again, our faith would have no meaning if we did not have Christ present in the exact manner which was just explained and confessed by the Sithios of Jerusalem. Also, St. Cyril of Jerusalem says on uh, the same matter, The Lord said it, 
this is my body. Who could possibly dare to question or doubt that this is not the body of Christ? And the Lord, who reassured this by saying, this is my blood, who can doubt that this is not the blood of Christ? Now, you're probably thinking that when we take communion, we don't feel or taste anything other than the bread and the wine. You might say this, sure. This is not important or significant. And we even have some people that at the time of receiving Holy Communion close their eyes, and as we mentioned earlier, an accident can take place when people close their eyes like this. So this is not really a good idea. At any rate, they close their eyes hoping to sentimentally perceive or sense beyond their senses the body and blood of Christ. In other words, they want to escape from their everyday senses. This is not good, not good at all. My senses will taste nothing but wine and bread. This is very simple. When Jesus Christ, the Word of God, became men and was recognized as Jesus, how did the people see him? Didn't they see a regular man? What more did they see? They were seeing a man. But what was he? Along with this man, the divine nature was united. Therefore, as they were seeing back then a common man, even though the divine nature was united with the human nature, in the same manner we see here common bread and common wine, although in reality it is the very body and blood of Christ. Just like they were not seeing the divinity of Christ in the same way, we do not perceive in this sacrament taste-wise or visibly the body and blood of Christ. How we would expect to see common flesh and regular blood. And if you will, this is very necessary, not only because with this method of the subject of faith is here maintained, but it would be very unsightly and shocking. We would be in shock like the people from Capernaum. How can we eat his flesh and eat his blood? But it is truly and really the body and blood of Christ. This, of course, happens to be the very center that the entire fiber of our faith revolves around. And if we extract this, then we are left with nothing. We have nothing. Then Christianity automatically becomes another philosophical system, if you will, or a sociological system, or a system of ethics, or whatever you will, but it ceases to be what it is. And something else. Where do all of the above stand on the fact that he who said them that this is my body and this is my blood, he resurrected and ascended into heaven. So he's truthful. So what he said is true. Everything stands on that. And this is the very, very big and important issue. I would like to add here that we should always try to increase our knowledge on the sacramental or liturgical phase of our church and we should always study around the sacramental actions that we partake because this brings us very close to the reality of our faith. And here, very much in tune with what Father Athanasios Mytilineos so beautifully explained to us, I will translate a short piece from the Yerondikon or the Book of the Desert Fathers. This short story was narrated by Saint Arsenius for the benefit of his disciples. They in turn wrote this along with other ones down that he told them, so they reached even us. Some hermit, more so from ignorance and lack of knowledge, did not want to accept that the holy bread that we partake happens to be the very body of Christ. The abbots or the elders that were informed about this called him and they attempted to explain to him the orthodox view of our church 
on the Immaculate and Holy Eucharist, so they would save him from his falsehood. However, he remained indignant, and nothing of what they said convinced him. The fathers left him, but they prayed to God fervently to enlighten him so he would understand the truth and not lose all the fruit of his labors. One Sunday, the hermit attended the Holy Liturgy along with two of the elders in the altar of the church at the monastery. At that time, the priest took the prosperon in his hands during proscomidi, the early part of the liturgy. They were all astonished from the appearance of an infant on the holy altar. And when the priest began to cut the holy bread in pieces, an angel of the Lord appeared on the holy altar with a knife in his hands. The angel was cutting the holy infant in pieces, while the priest was cutting the prosperon, and the blood was poured in the holy cup. The hermit with the erroneous belief was now in awe and extremely shaken from this fearsome vision. This awe, however, was changed to terror when after a few minutes, when he went to partake the sacraments and saw in the holy chalice human flesh dripping with blood. With tears and deep remorse, he confessed his falsehood. And furthermore, he beseeched the Lord to once again cover with his grace the holy mysteries so he would dare to partake of them. And he once again saw the bread and wine in the holy chalice. And uh, in closing, we will translate a small part of a letter of St. Basil sent to some pious lady called Patricia. It is good and beneficial to receive every day and to partake the holy body and blood of Christ because he himself tells us, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Who then can doubt that whoever takes part in his life constantly can only mean that he will live a long life. Here we make it our practice to take communion four times a week, Sunday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, and any other day that happens to be the name day of a saint.